Welcome to Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. We're at Lake of the Clouds in the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. This is like your happy place inside a happy place. This is very much a happy place. It's so quiet up here. We're here just a little bit in the off season, not quite, not quite peak colors, but after Labor Day. And it's just serene. And I don't really have the words to describe it. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the view. Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park is in the western end of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It is the state park that is the furthest west in Michigan. Uh, it is so large, it covers two time zones because it goes west into the central time zone and it covers two counties. It is actually 60,000 acres and 35,000 of those acres are virgin hardwood, which is amazing that they've been able to preserve this type of wilderness here in Michigan. Essentially, it's unchanged from the beginning of time, and that's kind of what makes it so special. Even though it didn't become a state park until 1945, its beginnings were 20 years earlier when P.J. Hoffmaster saw the value in it and decided that he needed to start the steps to make it a state park. It just happened to take that long to get through all the red tape um, and the legislature and everything that they needed to do to make such a vast tract of land a state park. Um, but it's essentially been unchanged. It's been here for a billion years. Uh, it was originally volcanic creation and then glaciers. And then, well, just over time. And because it's virgin, it means it's been uncut. It's primary forest. And it's been here forever, forever and ever and ever and ever. And it's just really cool. This is one of our favorite state parks, and we're excited to show you why. When most people think of the Porcupine Mountains, they think of here, the Lake of the Clouds Overlook, where you've got the entire range of the Porcupine Mountains behind you, Lake of the Clouds down below, and just the vastness of the scenery and the wilderness that's out here. It is beautiful. This is a must do. Yes, it's one of the more touristy areas in the busy season, but it doesn't matter. Uh, get in your vehicle and take the tall hill up to Lake of the Clouds. It's a pretty good climb, but vehicles can do it. You just might need lower gear. Uh, one note, though, the parking lot here, it says no trailers over 40 feet. So if you happen to be traveling with your trailer, leave it down below if it's a big one. Uh, but it is totally worth it. And then there's a couple of different ways to get up to the area where you can see the lake uh, and see the, the vast expanses you talked about because they did a good job with an ADA boardwalk. Uh, that comes all the way up to the top here. So that's really nice that they did that. Or you can take the little bit more challenging route and climb, sort of scramble up the rock side, um, which is what we did. Either way, it provides some breathtaking views and just, just gorgeous, gorgeous views of Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. It is especially pretty in the fall. We have been here mm. in October, and when these trees light up with all the colors of fall, it is amazing. Not that it isn't amazing today, but it is a completely different level of amazing. So yeah, this is definitely on the list of places that you need to see while you are here. Uh, on a clear day, which happens to be mm -hmm. today, you can see all the way to Copper Peak, which is where the ski jump is um, in the Upper Peninsula. And that is 20 miles from where mm -hmm. we're standing. And you can make it out today. You're up high enough here and on a clear day. It's, it's just a really, really neat view.
At the very far western edge of the Porcupine Mountains is the Presque Isle Scenic Area. This area consists of a trail system that runs on either side of the river. One side has a boardwalk and the other side has a little bit more of a challenging terrain with roots and hills and wet mud. But along the way, you can see three gorgeous waterfalls that at different times of the year are going to be a little bit more fast moving than others, depending on snow melt, rain, and the season that they've had here. The east side of the river trail is actually part of the North Country Trail, and that's the part where it's a little more difficult terrain, but it's really beautiful in there. It's a really nice hike. This is one of my favorite parts of coming to Porcupine Mountains is being able to do this hike along the river, crossing the river, when the water is down like it is now, it's early September. Uh, it is, you know, you're able to walk across the, the rocks and, and see everything from in the riverbed itself. And that's just really cool. No matter what time of year, I think it would be beautiful here. So if you ever get a chance to come to the Porcupine Mountains, make sure you take this river trail. On the map, it says the trail is about one mile in each direction. But as we found, it's a little bit more than that. And it's probably closer to three if you go the full circle all the way around. But if you're not up for the challenging terrain, just take the boardwalk. It's about three quarters of a mile down and you can see the falls or some overlooks. Uh, but if you do want the more challenging hike, plan on about an hour and a half to two hours, bring some water and a hiking pole, um, but go out there and have fun. We just completed the Summit Loop Trail, which is approximately five miles. We got done and we were at six miles, but then we realized we had sort of taken a detour to go visit some cabins that were an additional half mile there, half mile back, giving us about six miles. It took us three hours and 45 minutes to do the loop. And that included stopping for a snack, taking pictures, doing the video, and just enjoying what was on the trail. I think that's really important is sometimes we get so caught up in, you know, we want to get the perfect Instagram shot or the perfect video that we just have to stop and enjoy the moment. And it's so peaceful and quiet out there. I mean, there were some times where there was absolutely nothing, just no sound whatsoever. We'd recommend this trail for a beginner to intermediate level of hiking. It's got some fairly steep inclines and some rocks and mud and boardwalks to go across, but it's nothing overly strenuous that you can't handle if you just take your time with water, the right shoes, and a hiking pole. Uh, bring bug spray and a hat um, and maybe a long sleeve shirt depending on the time of year you're here just because you get into those trees and it can be kind of damp and chilly somewhere along the way. If you take the Summit Peak Loop, you're going to end up at Mirror Lake, uh, which is a really pretty lake. You'll have to wander down a little bit between the campsites and the trees to actually see the lake. But on a pretty blue summer day, it's a really gorgeous with the trees reflecting in the water. And then on the way back, you'll pass through some lowlands and some woods and some old growth forests and an open prairie section. And you'll pass Beaver Creek. And it's just really cool because there's just so much to see along the way. We saw a number of toads and chipmunks and we heard and saw an owl fly away. Didn't really get very close to it, but there's just a lot of wildlife out here. So take the time to just enjoy it. Don't worry about how long it's going to take you to do it. Just get out here and experience it. We're standing in Nunsuch, Michigan, a town that doesn't exist anymore. Although it showed up on my GPS when we parked in the parking area, which is really odd. This is a copper mining town that was in its heyday around 1890 or so. And they said there were about a hundred people that lived here, uh, had a, a full town and a school, yeah, uh, a, a uniformed baseball team even. It had made it to the big time. And now there's what you see behind us. It's pretty much just a, uh defunct archaeological site at this point in time. Uh, the community, they started out as a copper mine, although it was never profitable, except for two miles away became the most profitable mine in the UP. Um, so it's interesting, they started in this area, didn't find anything, but led the, whatever you call it, the copper vein, vein two miles east and essentially struck gold, but struck copper. Um, but yeah, this was well worth the trip. So the Little Dirt Road is not marked on the road at all. I mean, it's on, on the Porcupine Mountains map, but when you're driving by, there is no marker. You just have to know that there's a dirt road leading kind of into the woods with a parking lot, an interpretive sign. And then this really about three quarters of a mile hike through the woods till you come upon the ruins. And it's well worth it to come back here and see what's out here. It's it's one of those strange historical things. It's kind of eerie because you think about like this was a town and now it's just it's the woods have taken over again and, and overgrown. You see all these ruins and things, but it's also kind of magical to stand here and think about, you know, what were people doing and seeing and yeah. what would this have been like, you know, as a bustling town with over 100 people <laughs> in it? 
The Nunsuch community was built right on the river and next to what is now known as Nunsuch Falls. It's a pretty nice waterfall, nothing big, nothing to write home about particularly, but I think it was kind of nice and something that I think because this is really off the beaten path, even as far as Porcupine Mountains is concerned, I don't think very many people get down here and see this. It's really neat to see the history behind it. Another little interesting story is about two miles north of here is the site of the Hollowell Mine, which was never anything. It, it never not. produced anything um, and went out of business. It was like 1890 to 1916 they tried or something like that. Uh, but what was interesting there is there were a couple of brothers by the name of George and Gus who lived here in the Porcupine Mountains. They're actually from Nunsuch. They were the last two students to attend the school in Nunsuch. <laughs> Um, when the state acquired the property in that area in 1940, they issued a special permit so that George and Gus could keep living there. And they actually lived um, in one of the main buildings of the Hollowell mine and they just lived off the land. And it, it was yeah. kind of really cool. They talk about how early visitors to the park remember meeting and visiting with George and Gus. And yeah, they said they gave them tours and or yeah, George and Gus gave the visitors tours and directions on places to go. Um, unfortunately, everything's been torn down now after they passed away. Um, the state kind of cleared the land to let it, let it go back to its natural state. But so, yeah, the Hollowell mine property, um, the buildings and everything are gone. There is a mine shaft there that's blocked off, but you can see where that is. There's an informational sign. And if nothing else, um, that parking lot is marked. <laughs> and when you're there, you know, two miles south, almost exactly two miles south is the little dirt road you need to approach and get to none such. Were early settlers of the Upper Peninsula much larger people? Well, they clearly must have been. I think this is Paul Bunyan's shovel. <laughs> the Union Mine Interpretive Trail is about a mile long loop. And this is another one I would recommend if you're up for the hike. I don't see there's anything wrong with the hike, except for you have to know that there's rocks and roots and wet mud and a couple log crossings and some trees. But other than that, it's a fantastic hike and it's only a mile. So pretty much anybody can do this. Yeah, it's not a lot of elevation changes. So I don't think it's that so much. It's just more a matter of having to watch your footing. We're here after a night long rain. Um, so it's pretty muddy and slippery in here, but it's just something to be aware of to watch your footing and, and maybe not everybody's up for it. But if you can do it, it's really cool. Old growth forest, there's a lot of huge trees back in here. Really nice interpretive signs along the way. You can't get lost. And it's really nice signs that tell you kind of the history of the mine that was in the area and the people that were there. There's some journal entries. I just thought it was really well done. I agree. And I would encourage anybody to get out here and do this. At first, you might think it's like, oh, it's the touristy trail because you see those and sometimes in some of the bigger parks. But as I think I've learned with the Porcupine Mountains, there's nothing touristy about it. It's all the woods. It's all awesome. You've got the rocks and the trees and just the geological formations that are out here. You've got the history because you can see some of the old mine shafts. You can see some of the old rock walls where they used to haul the rock out of the mines and dump it, you know, on the shore of the riverbed. You can see where the old water wheel was that they used for power ge generation. So I think this was definitely on our list of things to do and recommendations if you are here in the Porkies. Plus, as you're walking around through here, there's all kinds of, you're along the river mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of little waterfalls and streams and different things to see. I was commenting earlier, I would love to see some of these during the spring runoff because there's some, what appear to be really large rock faces that would seem like a giant waterfall should be there. And it's just a really light trickle of water. I'm assuming in the spring that gets going pretty well. And I think that would be really neat to see, but no matter what time of year you get out here, well, maybe not in the winter, it might be a little harder in the winter. But there are, no, because you should get out here in the winter because we crossed a trail that clearly has a sign marked for a cross country skier on it. So you should, actually get out here in the winter this is true i was going to say <laughs> no matter what time of year you get out here you'll see some cool things you might actually see less in the winter because it'll be covered in a lot of snow but it would be a really neat place to do some cross-country skiing and, and kind of enjoy the wilderness so any time of year i i love the porkies so i always yeah. say come on out here proper equipment is always a key so no matter what time of year you come out bring the proper footwear and the gear bring your raincoat a hat bug spray maybe bear spray, a hiking pole for sure would be a recommendation. Just be prepared because it is the wilderness. It is Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. So just be prepared no matter what the terrain and, and the weather.
You were saying something about rocky riverbeds. Oh, it's just interesting. Usually when you think of a river, you think of a, you know, mucky or sandy riverbed. But here in the UP, or at least in the Porcupine Mountains, it's nothing but solid rock. Every riverbed is literally nothing but solid rock because, well, we're standing on nothing but solid rock. I mean, the, the escarpments and the cliffs here were carved out originally from volcanic ash and then the glaciers. So between the two of them, or not volcanic ash, volcanic rock. And then the glaciers came along behind that and created what we have today. But it's just totally different than anything you'll ever see anywhere else. When it comes to camping at Porcupine Mountains, there are a lot of options to consider depending on what type of rig you have or what you like to do in terms of getting out and camping. We're at the Union Bay Campground is where we've been staying the past couple of nights. And this is the modern campground for the Porkies. There's also on the other end of the park, the Presque Isle. Presque Isle. I think they're saying Presque Isle. It's, you know, we have multiple places in the state named Presque Isle, Isle and everybody pronounces them differently. We'll say Presque Isle <laughs> Campground. And that one is rustic. We have stayed there in previous years. It's really, really nice over there too. Yeah, one of the things to note about that section is there's there's 50 campsites in the Presque Isle section, um, but half of them are generator and half of them are non-generator. And they're really just sort of separated by the middle of the road. But at least if you know you reserve in the non-generator section, you won't have somebody directly next to you with a generator. There are also, I think, five or six walk-in only tent sites so that you kind of park and then you'd walk in. Um, so that's available, but there is rustic toilets over there, as well as a really pretty view of Lake Superior. Here in the Union Bay Campground, there are 100 campsites. About 30 of them are right along Lake oh. Superior. They're down below us Gorgeous here. Gorgeous view. Gorgeous view of Lake Superior. The rest of it, there's not a lot of privacy. And you, I think, read on some of the reviews people were bothered by during the busy peak season, uh, it's packed in pretty tight. People are really kind of on top of each other, and it can be pretty noisy up here in the section that we're in. Yeah, and I can see that. I mean, we're here at a relatively middle off season time. There's quite a few people in this campground, but there's a lot of open sites as well. And people have come and gone over the few days that we've been here. Um, but the section that we're in, now that I've kind of been here and seen people come and go for a few days, you would really be on top of your neighbor because like our fire pit and the people's picnic table behind us are like right next to each other. And so there's a quadrant um, that you really would feel like you're on top of each other. So you're here because you're here to see the porkies. You're not really here to just camp like you maybe you would in some other campgrounds. And so I think that you're just going to have to put up with the fact that you're going to be right next to your neighbors, but you're likely not going to be spending a whole lot of time at your campsite because you're going to be out exploring. So I wouldn't let that bother you too much. It's totally worth it to be here and put up with some neighbors and just go out <laughs> and explore the Porkies. Uh, if you don't want to do the official campgrounds like, they, like the two we've just talked about, there are also rustic campgrounds that are non-reservable. We should mention the Presque Isle one that is um, rustic is reservable. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some that are non-reservable. It's first come, first serve. Uh, there are backcountry campsites where you actually hike in a few miles and set up your tent. Uh, there's some backcountry cabins. There's a few yurts located around the area. There's, um, I think they said 63 total backcountry types of camping, whether then it's a hike in with a cabin or a tent. If you want to try even more rustic camping at the Porkies, you can hike out one of the trails. This happens to be Mirror Lake Trail, and there are, right on Mirror Lake, there are four campsites out here for tenting. It's super peaceful, super quiet. Right now, there's only one person out here camping, and I think in busy summer, there's probably quite a few more, well, I guess up to four on this side. But if you're coming out here, you're coming out here for the peace and quiet. So I don't think you're going to have any noisy neighbors. You're going to come out here for the serenity to sit by the lake, enjoy uh, what nature has to offer, and just kind of be out here by yourself. Except maybe for the bears. Uh, <laughs> and the <some> mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, you have to be prepared for dealing with wildlife. You're out in the wilderness. There are bear poles here. I was surprised they're really tall here. They're 12 feet, I think you said. Mm -hmm. uh, usually they're not that tall in other places I've seen, but uh, 12 foot bear poles here. So maybe the bears are taller in the porkies. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, the the one guy that was out camping, we didn't. He was he was out um, filling up his water bottle in the lake, and we didn't want to startle him, so we said hi and he goes oh good just making sure that you weren't a bear <laughs> so when you're out by here by yourself i suppose that could be a little bit unnerving because every noise 
you might jump and think, oh my gosh, there's a bear. But no, it's just other hikers. It's it's just about using, you know, common sense when you're taking care of food, packing your food, keeping it safe, have bear spray with you if you're out yeah. hiking out here, that kind of thing. You're mm -hmm. out in the wilderness. That's the point. Right. And you pack in and you pack out. That's mm -hmm. sort of the general rule and just be considerate of everything. But yeah, if you have the opportunity and the right equipment to go backpacking in the wilderness, we highly recommend that you do that. And we're hoping that we can come back and do that sometime when we have a little bit more time on our trip. Just remember, Mother Nature is not your mother, so clean up after yourself. Take it with you. Now, if you like the idea of the serenity, the peace and the quiet in the wilderness, but sleeping on the ground in a tent and hanging your food on a bear pole might be a bit much for you. and Or digging a hole in the woods, you know, to use the bathroom facilities. Yeah, it's not for everybody. <laughs> there are cabins that you can rent here at the Porkies with their own outhouse. With four walls and a deck. And enclosures, so you still have to hike everything in and hike everything out, but at least you have a little bit more of a roof over your head. Yeah, in case of inclement weather or angry critters. <laughs> but yeah, this is kind of a cool option too if you have the idea of wanting to get out here, but you're not quite ready to put a tent up on the ground. All of the backcountry campsites, you do have to check in at the visitor center to get. Some of them you can reserve online, such as the cabins and the yurts, and even the backcountry campsites, because I've been seeing signs that say, registration is not the same as permit. So when you arrive, you can't just park and hike into your campsite. You have to check into the visitor center first because they need to know that you're out there. This is the wilderness after all. And so you just need to make sure that everybody is accounted for if something were to go wrong or if there was a bad storm or, or just something was to happen. But we're, I think we're really looking forward to the next time we come here, maybe trying out one of those backcountry campsite options. Regardless of what type of camping you like to do, there is an option here to do it, and it's totally worth it because it is the Porcupine Mountains. So pick something that uh, you want to stay at and find a way to get here because it's very much worth it. Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park probably ranks as our favorite park within the Michigan Park System. There's just so much to offer here that you could literally spend days, weeks, months, forever hiking the trails and just hanging out here and never seeing everything. It is one of the last bits of untapped wilderness in Michigan. It is in a beautiful area of the Upper Peninsula. If you want to get out and see what's here, there are 90 miles of trails. And that's everything from, you know, a little bit simpler boardwalk trails to more intense hiking trails and then everything in between. Since the Porkies is really essentially a mountain range, you're going to have some peaks that you have to climb, the highest being a little over a thousand. And so if you're hiking through the backcountry, you're going to have to go up a thousand feet and then down a thousand feet. Now, it's going to zigzag a little bit in between. And in some cases, you don't have to go that high. But there is truly a good experience for everybody out here. And we're hoping that sometime we can actually, you know, delve into that untapped wilderness that is the middle of the Porcupine Mountains. We just scratched the surface on this trip. Um, and this is our second time that we've been here. And so it's just every time it gets a little bit better and we get a little bit further into that wilderness. We have been here a couple of times. It's been a few days each time. And, and like you said, we just scratched the surface. So there's just so much to see and do here. It's really pretty. Take the time to experience it. Take the time to just slow down and listen to what's going on around you when you're out in the wilderness. There are many places in this park where there is zero cell service. <laughs> take advantage of that and just enjoy the moment. Um, get some pictures and video to take it home with you, but you know, stay off the phones other than that. But yeah, it is one of the places, I, I will say, and you and I have talked about this, it's probably one of the least friendly parks in terms of ADA accessibility, um, just because of the way it's built and the terrain that's here. They have tried. Um, Lake of the Clouds has a really nice boardwalk system to it. You know, it's ADA accessible, mm -hmm. so you can get up there and see that. And I was going to say, Presque Isle has a boardwalk, but it's still a good number of steps to get down to the water. So I don't think that particularly would count as that. Like I said, they've tried, but but it's a wilderness. I mean, they, you truly have to just understand what there is to work with in some cases. So... I think it's still a pretty place to camp. It's a pretty place to visit. I think everybody should come here. As we said, it's like way up here. I mean, it's the farthest place west that you can go on the Upper Peninsula, meaning it's obviously much closer to Wisconsin than it is to most of the rest of the state. Um, so we saw a lot of people here from Wisconsin, Minnesota that have made the trip over. And it truly just is a, a fabulous, fabulous park. And we can't recommend it enough. Get here if you can. There are different experiences all year round. The summer is great. It's a little bit busier. The fall is really nice. You start to get into 
the fall color time, it's really, really mm-hmm. beautiful as you see those leaves start to turn. But even, you know, when the colors haven't turned yet, some of these old growth trees that are out here are just phenomenal to see and, and look up at and stare and think about the history that they have been through. So get out here if you can. Keep on trekking. And we'll see you out there.